Microphones muted till your uh, time uh, comes. And uh, may I now request our director, Professor Sujata Verma, to deliver the welcome address. Madam. Thank you all and greetings. Honorable Minister of State, Ministry of Education, Dr. Subhash Sarkati, our Honorable Vice Chancellor of Vigno, Professor Nandeshwar Ravuji, invited speaker, Professor Singhvini, and our four vice chancellors of you know, Professor Satyakan, Professor Umar Gandhila, Professor Sumita Kokreti, Professor R.P. Singh, Dr. Srikant Mohapatra, dignitaries, dear colleagues, and my dear learners, a hearty welcome and greetings to you all on the occasion of National Science Day celebration, a day to embody true spirit of science. It's a great honor for you know, to have Dr. Subhar Sarkarji, Honorable Minister of State for Education, as our chief guest for today's celebration. We are highly grateful to you, sir, for sparing your valuable time with us as chief guest. As a distinguished gynecologist, sir, who have given birth to 30,000 babies over a span of 20 years, you are a great healer of humankind, sir, and a greatest healer of womankind, especially of poor people, sir. A hearty welcome to you, sir, on this celebration. My special welcome to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Nagesh Rauji, who have a constant source of inspiration and encouragement and guide us to take IGNO at its height, sir. A hearty welcome, sir. It's a gratifying experience for us to have Professor Akvi Singhviji, a nuclear geophysics scientist, currently DST, SCRB chair, Professor at PRL Ahmedabad to deliver a special lecture on the event yeah. on the theme Integrated Approach in Science and Technology for Science for a Sustainable Future. We are very thankful to say a hearty welcome, sir. As we are aware, National Science Day commemorates the discovery of Raman effect by Sri C. V. Raman, the first Indian to receive Nobel Prize in the most adverse conditions. From ancient times, Curiosity has been at the heart of scientific discovery. It is said in Hitopadesha, Aneka Samsayo Chedi, Padok Shastasya Darshanam, Sarvasya Lojanam Shastram, Yesya Nastyanda Evasa. Science blasts many doubts, forces what it is not obvious. Science is the eye for everyone. One who has not got it is like a blind. This emphasizes the need to develop scientific temper scientific thinking and reasoning for all. The very objective of School of Sciences is to nurture this and to impart quality science education. Access, equity, inclusion is our motto, sir. 
Employability is one of the focus for NEP 2020, which recognizes the role of education in providing students with the right skill sets. We at the School of Sciences have several skill-based courses, which is in the which are integral part of our BSc CBCF program. These courses, when aligned with NDP 2020 framework, will help to ensure inclusive and equitable quality science education, which is, which is interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary in nature, and offer flexibility and multiple entry and multiple ex and exit options. So yeah, we have 140 science courses in the range of two credits up to eight credits, which enable students to open their account in academic bank of credits. The programs of School of Sciences ranges from PhD program and MSc program in mathematics and BSc honors programs in all basic sciences and applied sciences also. And we have value added programs also and capacity building programs. With the community enrollment of 80,000 learners of science program, it's a big challenge to provide hands-on training through practical courses. We have successfully achieved this for BSc program with 200 lab centers, which is managed by our 56 regional centers across the country. Now we have this, we have successfully done this for our BSc program. Now we have taken up the challenge of offering MSc program in all basic science uh, programs and also applied sciences also. And with multiple entry and exit options wherever possible, sir. While we are committed to hands-on training, we supplement this with innovative demonstration videos also. All these are achieved through, sir, with the effort of the faculty strength in the disciplines of biochemistry, chemistry, geology, geography, life sciences, which includes botany and zoology, mathematics, physics, and statistics, sir. Sir, uh, for all, let us think scientifically and act scientifically. With this, once again, I extend my warm welcome to you all, sir, on this special day. May I now request our Honorable Minister of State for Education, Dr. Subhash Khargarji, to inaugurate this event by lighting the lamp virtually, sir. Yes, uh, I am virtually inaugurating the program. Thank you, sir, for this formal inauguration. Sir, School of Sciences IGNU invited short videos from IGNU learners on innovative product process method on the theme, integrated approach in science and technology for sustainable future. Sir, Rashtriya Vigyan Divas ke avasar par ayojit is webinar ka prasang hai sandharaniya bhavishya ke liye vigyan evang pradyogi ki me ek ek krdrishti kon. 18 videos were received and a committee selected the best two of them which I now request Professor Deepika to display. The first one is on soil contamination due to man-made migration of materials. It involves going back to roots. Hello, we are a group of third-year BSEG students from Kerala. Geology is one of our major subjects and we are here to present some of our observations and findings about soil contamination due to man-made migration of materials. For a simplified explanation, we focused on the construction of buildings. The initial thought of these observations came from another project we have done, which is the identification of rock around us. As a part of the study, we collect samples from our resident areas. During this process, we also found an evident presence of concrete and other building materials in our soil. Such materials are foreign to our landscape, which will eventually change the character of our soil. Handling and disposing of such materials without any proper precaution can cause instant damage to our ecosystem. This picture is a perfect example of such activity. As you can see, the color of the soil is gray, which is due to the frequent deposits of construction waste. It completely destroys the vegetation in a very short period. So in short, exceeding the amount of materials like this are harmful to our ecosystem. The question is what we can do. 
For the reduction of the contamination, we suggest incorporating the traditional construction material with a modern technology. A perfect example is a traditional Kerala house, which is shown in the picture. A construction of such a house entirely depends upon local materials. The walls and roof are built from the mud and trees available on the property. And the roof tiles are locally available. Reviving such local methods with the backing of modern technology will definitely reduce the soil pollution due to the construction of buildings. With this note, we end this presentation. Thank you. The second one is on Kia AI. It's about automation using artificial intelligence. And one thing, the innovative product or process which you are describing, is there not any video? Video process or product? If not, yes, you can tell through audio only. Uh, Yes, sir, this is the video where it is showing about the artificial intelligence that they have used. This boy. Please turn on the coffee machine. Coffee maker machine has been switched on. Anything else for you? Please turn off. Coffee maker machine has been switched off. Anything else for you? Please turn off light. Please turn off light. Electric world has been switched off. Anything else for you? अगर एक हाथ विज्ञान की तरक्की में लगा हुआ है तो दूसरा हाथ प्रकृति की सुरक्षा में लगाना चाहिए विज्ञान संगठित ज्ञान है विज्ञान सोचने का एक तरीका है नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट आवर सोर्स ऑफ इंस्पिरेशन आवर वाइस चांसलर सर प्रोफेसर नागेश्वर राव टू एड्रेस दिस ऑगस्ट गैदरिंग सर Honorable Minister of Higher Education, Sri Subhash Sarkarji, Singhvi Saab, the distinguished speaker of the day, my colleagues at IGNU, faculty of the School of Sciences, and distinguished invitees. Great and momentous occasion to all of us. The presence of our Honorable Minister of State, Sri Subhash Sarkarji on this occasion is a great moral booster to all of us. National Science Day, he is a great scientist scientist in the field of 
medical science and blessing all of us on this auspicious occasion by inaugurating this event virtually we know that he is awfully busy he is on a official tour but still he spared time for us to inspire us and motivate us i express my sincere regards and respects for his kind support and motivation to all of us and that to on this occasion which is being celebrated as the national science day and motivate us as has been told by I, professor sujata verma that it is the raman effect the starting point of this prestigious event and then every year we go for it we also involve our young students young learners to go for experimentation and innovations we have gone for a national talent test and good number of videos they have received it and only two select videos they have been presented before the honorable minister as has been told by the director school of sciences that we do have flagship program of undergraduate in science and also post graduation in science also because conducting labs for a science program is a difficult task in open and distance learning but we are reaching through our regional center and study centers to those places where already the practicals of these disciplines they are being carried on they are the universities they are the national institutes of importance the science in a two day learn practical things which are essential for the science discipline we impart education to science students at an affordable cost the fees the annual fees is around 5000 or so and for 3 years it is around 15000 wherein we also provide the study materials we also provide counseling sessions and we also provide this facilities for lab the study material is of very very high quality and we also see that the numbers are not important in case of science discipline we are concerned with quality education and it is the biggest school in the university having eight to nine disciplines and the number of faculties who are involved in this process they are also the highest in terms of the strength because that is the requirement that is the basic requirement for ablation and also to reach to the learners through direct counseling also we do have an empc gyan darshan in your last visit honorable minister visited that electronic media production center that is also being used to for counseling sessions of these science students we are also having the four swayam prabha channels recently we had made an experimentation to use our swayam prabha channels to impart 
our teaching learning process through regional languages, 13 regional languages. Of course, initially we started this process for the social science subjects, history, political science, sociology, environmental sciences, and they are being taught now in 13 regional languages, Telugu, Kannada, Malayalam, Marathi, Bengali, Punjabi, Assamese. You see that the purpose is that at least our learner, they may understand those subjects in their own mother tongue. And this process we started from 6th of January. And by this time, more than 350 sessions we have conducted. And soon, the subjects in the science also, we are going to impart in these regional languages. Because our objective is to reach the unreached. Our objective is to provide quality education to all those people who are the disadvantaged groups. And science is the mother of all sciences. Medical sciences, environmental science. It talks about reasoning. It nurtures our mind, left hand side of the brain. We become and rational. Dr. C V is also present over here, who is going to enlighten all of us. And Honorable Minister, his benign presence is a source of inspiration and motivation to all of us. I know that he is very, very busy, but even his presence also, and that too, much before we expected, he inaugurated it, very kind to us. The moment we made a request, he immediately agreed. Great love for distance education, great love for reaching the unreached great affection and support to those who are getting these higher education at an affordable cost at their doorsteps. And the Indira Gandhi National Open University is world's biggest university. Having this sort of mandate nationally as well as internationally to provide this quality of education. Honorable Minister Sir, we seek your valuable inputs, words of encouragement, motivation, and your blessings to all of us. We are eagerly want to listen to you. Sir, your presence is presentation. I humbly pay my respectful regards to you for your benign presence. Thank you very much for your Thank you, sir. Inspiring words. It gives us immense pride to convey that today we have amongst us Dr. Shubhash. Dr. Sarkar has successfully overseen the delivery of about 33,000 babies. Dr. Sarkar chaired many scientific and social seminars, a social worker since youth. He is in the public life for around five decades. From 2013 to 2015, he was Vice President of BJP West Bengal. 2015 to 2017, General Secretary BJP West Bengal. 2017 onwards, Vice President BJP West Bengal. In May 2019, he was elected to 17th Lok Sabha. In 7th August, 
2021 onwards, he is serving as the Union Minister of State for Education, Government of India. Dr. Sarkar is associated with different programs of philanthropic and social organizations like Ram Krishna Mission, Bharat Shevasram Shangha, etc. Lastly, personally, I can say that even if you meet him for a few minutes, you will be awestruck with his gentle personality, which I think may be described in words of Rabindranath Tagore as Nirabu hoye, namro hoye, pon koryo pran. Be silent, humble, put your life on stake, free yourself from fear, give yourself a strong identity in difficult work. Sir, we are honored to have you as the chief guest of this webinar on National Science Day. Honorable Minister of State, Ministry of Education, Government of India, Dr. Shubhash Sarkarji, we are looking forward to listen to your address on this occasion, sir. Big salute. Namaskar, warm greetings to all. Professor Nageshwar Raoji, Vice Chancellor, Indira Gandhi National Open University. Professor A.K. Singh Ji, GST, Chair Professor, Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. Professor Shujata Barma Ji, Director, School of Science. Director of Schools, Heads of Various Divisions and Centers. Teachers of the University and all my dear students. Before I start my speech, uh, my humble submission in correction of my introduction, my date of taking oath is 7th July 2021. And the number of babies born to my hand, that was 33,000 in 2014. And later on, it becomes 40,000. Let us start with a Sanskrit sloka. Sarvasho lochanam shastram aneko shangsha chedi padakshartasho darshakam sarvasho lochana shastram yasha nastandha evasha. It is that science is the only eye. It blurs many doubts, forces, what is not obvious. Science is the eye of everyone and one who has not got to quote our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi Ji, who while delivering a speech at 107th Indian Science Congress in the year 2020, said the growth story of India depends on its achievements in the science and technology sector. We need to revolutionize the landscape of Indian science, technology, and innovation. My motto for the young scientist bargaining in this country has been innovate, patent, produce and prosper. He said, these four steps will lead India towards faster development, innovation for the people and by the people in the direction of our new India, he added. My dear friends, it gives me immense happiness to inaugurate the National Science Day celebration on the themes integrated approach in science and technology for a sustainable future organized by the School of Sciences, IGNU. National Science Day 
is celebrated in India on 28th February each year to mark the discovery of the Raman effect by Indian physicist C.V. Raman in 1928 on this day. In 1986, the National Council for Science and Technology Communication asked the government of India to designate February 28th a National Science Day. Sir C.V. Raman, with his prodigious talent and hard work, overcame immense odds to place the country and influence firmly on the global firmament. He received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1930 for his discovery of the Raman effect. The discovery of the Raman effect has an interesting story. In 1921, C.V. Raman was on a trip to Europe when he noticed the striking blue color of some iceberg and the Mediterranean Sea. He was inspired to want to understand the reason behind the phenomena. He conducted experiments with transparent blocks of ice and light from a mercury arc lamp. He recorded the spectrum from shining the light through ice and detected what would come to be known as the Raman lines caused by the Raman effect. Raman effect, the name given to the change in the wavelength of the light that happens when a light beam is scattered by the molecules of a medium. This effect is negligible and extremely difficult to measure. Yet, working with simple instruments in his small laboratory at the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Kolkata, C.V. Raman and his co-workers discovered the Raman effect. They carried out meticulous experiments on several liquids. Raman's biographer and former student, A. Jai Raman, writes that his equipment cost a total of only rupees 500 at the time. The change in wavelength seen in the Raman effect is also a characteristic of the molecule and can be used to identify the material he work give his work gave rise to the technique of raman spectroscopy raman spectroscopy is an am i audible am i audible yes sir yes sir very much sir very much sir audible sir is, uh, okay. Robert Spectroscopy yeah. is an important characterization to today. It helps us study chemical structures, characterizes materials, identifies molecules, analyzes living cells without harming them, identifies pharmaceutical, chemical, and discovers counterfeit drugs identifies pigments in ancient artifacts like painting and even to detect diseases such as cancers. Sri Shivi Raman's life is a story of persistence, sacrifice and devotion to science. An immensely gifted student, he graduated with a BA degree from Presidency College in Madras at the age of only 16, he stood fast in his class and received a gold medal in physics and English. He published his first scientific paper at the age of 18 while pursuing his MA degree. Since scientific career opportunities were rare in the, those times, he took a job in Kolkata as assistant accountant general, mind it. 
as assistant accountant general. Sri C. V. Raman worked his regular job in the daytime and carried out after hours research at the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. In 1917, he resigned from his lucrative civil service job when Sri Ashutosh Mukherjee, the vice chancellor then, offered him a Palit Chair Professorship at Calcutta University. In a scientific career spanning over seven decades, he wrote over 475 research papers, an incredible feat even by today's standards. That he achieved all this with far less than a, what is common today is even more incredible. His lifelong efforts were directed at propagating the spirit of research and scientific temper across the country. Science generates solutions for everyday life and helps us to answer the great mysterious of the universe. It has a specific role as well as a variety of functions for the benefit of our society, creating new knowledges, improving education, and increasing quality of our lives. Science Day is not just about applauding the discovery of the Raman effect, but it is the day that inspires us to think of all the names associated with the science and technology. I would also like to mention some other well-known Indians who are linked with the fields of utmost finding and innovations. Along with Sir C. V. Raman, one of the most remembered names is Dr. Shanti Sharu Bhartnagar. He was the founder director of the director and later the first director general of the Council and Scientific and Industrial Research, which is known as CSIR, who is credited with establishing in as many years. Dr. Bhartnagar played a significant role in the building of post-independent s &T, science and technology infrastructure and the formulation of India's science and technology policies. He was the first chairman of the University Grant Commission. He played a, a role in the establishment of the National Research Development Corporation of India. His research contribution in the areas of magnetochemistry and physical chemistry of emulsion were widely recognized. If I talk further about the Indian scientist, I would mention the name of Sri Homi Jahangir Bhava. Dear friends, he played an important role in the quantum theory. He was the first the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission of India. He is generally acknowledged as the father of Indian nuclear power. Moving forward, let's talk about Shatendranath Bosch. Shatendranath Bosch was an Indian physicist specializing in quantum mechanics. He is, of course, most remembered for his role played in the clash of particles, that is, Boschans, which were named after him by Paul Derek to commemorate his work in the field. Dear friends, I would mention Meghnath Shah. Meghnath Shah's best known work concerned the thermal ionization of elements and it led him to formulate what's known as the Shah equation. Moving forward, let's talk about Jagdish Chandra Bosch. He was a polymath, physicist, biologist, botanist, and the archaeologist. He pioneered the study of radio and microwave optics. 
made important contribution to, to the study of plants and laid the foundation of experimental science in the Indian subcontinent. Also, I would like to talk about Vikram Shalabhai. He was considered the father of India's space program. He was instrumental in the setting up of the Indian Space Research Organization, which is known as ISRO. Dear friends, the former president of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, worked as an aerospace engineer with Defense Research and Development Organization, which is known as DRDO, and Indian Space Research Organization, that is the ISRO. His work in the field of research is also outstanding. His prominent role in the country's 1998 nuclear weapons test solidified India as a nuclear power and established Dr. Kalam as a national hero. Although the test caused great concern in the international community. Dear friends, in 1998, Dr. Kalam put forward a countrywide plan called Technology Vision 2020, which he described as a roadmap for transforming India from a less developed to a developed society in 20 years. The plan called for, among other measures, increasing agricultural productivity, emphasizing technology as a vehicle for economic growth and widening access to healthcare and education. Moving towards, moving forward, let's talk about some Indian women who were associated with the science and technology world. Oshima Chatterjee was an Indian organic chemist noted for her work in the fields of organic chemist chemistry and phytomedicine. Dear friends, I would like to talk about one of the first Indian female doctors who practiced with a degree in modern medicine and her name is Kadombini Ganguly. Also, I would like to name Kamal Ranadivhe was an Indian biomedical researcher known for research on the links between cancers and viruses. She was a founding member of the Indian Women Scientists Association. Our ancient schools and teachers followed comprehensive ways of imparting education and maintained high standards in evaluation. India was known for its world-class institution such as Nalanda, Vikram Shila, Takshashila, Vallavi, etc. where quality multidisciplinary teaching and research were common. These institutions produced great scholars such as Charaka, Shusruta, Aryabhatta, Barahomiro, Vaskalacharya, Brahmagupta, Chanaka, Panini, Gargi, among numerous others who made seminal contribution to the growth of knowledge in diverse <coughs> fields like mathematics, astronomy, medical science, yoga, fine arts, surgery, and also the civil engineering. Ancient India has contributed enormously to the world of science, mathematics, Ayurveda, literature, economics, engineering, astronomy, and the human values. It should come as no surprise that the first recorded use of the number zero recently discovered to be made as early as the third or fourth century happened in India. As well as giving us the concept of zero, Indian mathematician made seminal contribution to the study of trigonometry, algebra, arithmetic, and negative numbers among other areas. Dear friends, there is a need 
to rebuild the education model where special attention should be given to Indian knowledge system and this should be taught to our students. My dear friends, IGNU plays an important role in nurturing scientific talent by providing quality science education in natural science and interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary areas. IGNU has taken education in the doorstep of every Indian household. It has the national responsibility of promoting and setting benchmark for open and distance learning. IGNU is mandated to make quality education accessible to all cutting across geographical or physical, social and economical barriers and also to provide opportunities for lifelong quality education at affordable costs. The university's online portals, that is EGAN Kosh, an online repository of study materials, that is a text, audio, video, and web enabled academic support portal have proved to be the effective in providing academic support services to learners at the click of a mouse. Employability is one of the focuses of our National Education Policy 2020, which recognizes the role of education in providing students with the right skill sets. Dear friends, skill-based courses are an integral part of the CBCS program at the School of Sciences. These courses, when aligned with the NEP 2020 framework, will help to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education, which are interdisciplinary of our multiple entry and exit options. Dear friends, today is the validatory of a countrywide week-long science festival that is Vigyan Sharvatra Pujyati. As a part of our government's year-long Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsha program, four themes were identified for the week-long celebration. The first is Annals of Science, which will trace how and in this contribution helped India to establish a modern science and technology system. The second theme is milestones of modern science and technology, which will explore key discoveries, innovations, and inventions that made a mark in the global science or India's development story. The third theme is is very important that is a Shadeshi Paramparik invention and innovations, which will highlight inventions or technologies that helped India's goal of reliance, including modern innovations that draw upon the reservoir of the traditional knowledge system. And the fourth theme is transforming India which will cover grand science and technology mission, such as Gaganayan and Shamudrayan. Today's India is youth-centric and dedicated to the youth. They form more than 65% of the nation's population. This is very good achievement for us. This is a matter of rejoicing, but along with it, comes great responsibility. We have to utilize the demographic dividend in a meaningful and productive manner. Dear friends, our government is committed to doing this along with traditional and also conventional education. We have to stress a skill-based curriculum. The government has supported the establishment of new startups, both in the software sector and the manufacturing sector, it has made the process of registration 
of companies much more easier and how only one single form needs to be submitted as the integrated document dear friends a frequently asked question is how do we get skill level to power our new business the government has tried to deal with this problem as well as through the skill india program run by the national skill development corporation the skill india program will provide a skilled workforce to the entrepreneurs and help them to expand their business we understand that establishing a business might also need foreign investment and we have to increase the fdi caps across several industries to promote foreign investment dear friends you are all of you as scientific minds are encouraged to take advantage of all these opportunities to build more ventures in the country this will also directly promote the make in india mission of the government the mantra should we become job creators rather than the job seekers dear friends along with make in india we have also received a call from our honorable prime minister sri narendra modi ji to work on the path of atmanirbhar bharat this goal of atmanirbhar bharat is a fundamental pillar to india's growth as a world power in the coming decades as you may have all noticed countries across the world are taking steps to ensure that the latest technologies which have been developed by their companies cannot be transferred to other countries they have done so much bringing about mechanisms to screen purchases of foreign companies and have also tried to make sure that only the final products are exported this is very important this is a wake up call for us and we need to build the expertise and technology to produce critical products within the country shortly dear friends true atmanirbharata will be linked to our ability to produce cutting edge products to meet all our critical needs and ensure that the economy and we can continue to grow unhindered the benefits of the presence of a strong domestic industry could be seen in the covid-19 crisis itself when due to the strong domestic pharmaceutical industry we could produce large quantities of essential medicinal equipments not only use, but could also for trees dear friends we are also among the leading countries in the field of vaccine development and production and the world is looking forward to our pharma companies producing vaccines for a large part of the global population last but not the least i would like to share a small excerpt related to shami vivekananda shami ji was fascinated by the concept of creation given by nashadita shukta the only one that there was hammered itself to bring out the creation from this samaji developed the concept of prana and akasha there is the energy and the matter coming out of the same substance this is very important now which which our modern science tells yes that is the truth and thus to being one in the day of loka that is the electric sphere dear friends the great scientist nicolas tesla 
was fascinated by these ideas of Shamiji in 1986 and it could wait for another 10 years for Einstein to do work out independently the equivalence of matter and energy in his new famous equation that is known as E is equal to mc square. E is the energy, m is the mass, and c is the light velocity, the square of the velocity of light. We can imagine. Dear friends, I wish you all the very best towards achieving the highest scientific goals for the country and spreading the fire of nationalism and self-dignity in the minds of every Indian, every youth, Jai Hind, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Thank you, sir, for this awe-inspiring address. Uh, Vice Chancellor, sir, so it's a great this thing. And uh, Professor Nageshwar Rao, uh, director of like School of Sciences. Our uh, this uh, School of Sciences have a great role in Vigyan Sarvatra Puja, the mission of science communication, popularization, and extension program in that i think school of sciences have a great role in that and we will take it up with all enthusiasm sir so now vice chancellor sir okay uh, thank you sir honorable minister dr shubhash sarkar ji Thank you for your thought-provoking address. And uh, uh, you have been really enlightening us with not only the scientists of India, of the statue of Shanti Sharup Bhatnagar, the DG of CSIR, to Oshima Chatterjee, the woman scientist, organic chemistry and phytomedicine, to Kadumbini Ganguly, the first woman medicine practitioner. And uh, uh, we have been knowing that the multidisciplinary studies have been carried out from Nalanda, Takshashila, with the teachers of like Charaka, Pani, Gargi. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, sir, skill-based courses, which we have developed in CBCS, when aligned with NEP 2020, we will have multiple entry and exits. So uh, they will help maybe to help in the Skill India program, which is their government of India for government of India. And the Swadeshi Paramparik, uh, the milestones of modern science, the innovations, the transforming India, all these points, which are the, the valedictory session of Vigyan Sarvatru Pujyate, as you said, and uh, make an India mission, job creators rather than job seekers, Yes, we have been enlightened with all these programs that the government of India looks forward for Atmanirbhar Bharat. So if there are any more interactions, Madam uh, Director, School of Sciences, you would like to do with uh, our minister, Honorable Minister? Yes, Before we move to the next program, uh, yeah, uh, any anything from uh, points to be shared with sir or any interaction?
Lost of a network connection from the director's room. So, uh, I think in the entire building we are having network issues. Professor Kamalika, we can begin with the Professor Singhvi's address because there is network issues, and I think director won't be able to join. We are on our mobile network, so we are connected. Yeah, that will be better. I think Professor Kamalika, if she has joined. Kamalika, madam, your mic is muted. Muted. Unmute. Yeah, I have joined with mobile. Yes. So, uh, thank you, sir, Honorable Minister of State for Education, Dr. Subhash Sarpaji, for your address. We are very sorry for the internet connection, which uh, was just uh, lost for all of us. In, and so, Director of School of Sciences have left uh, uh, the meeting for that. So I've joined from mobile. And I, I give. Uh, I, we are all overwhelmed and proud to have you among us. Thank you, sir. So after this, we have a talk by Professor A. K. Singhvi on musings on academia with scientific social responsibility for a sustainable future. Please post comments or questions in the chat box, which we will take up at the end of the talk. Dr. Singhvi did his PhD from IIT Kanpur in nuclear physics. He then joined physical research laboratory PRL Ahmedabad and superannuated from there. He took up geosciences and established a laboratory for luminescent geochronology. Dr. Singhvi is currently a DSP SCRB year of science chair professor at PRL. He served as the Vice President of Indian National Science Academy, Vice President of International Quaternary Union, and as a member of editorial boards of 10 international journals. Professor Singhvi supervised 17 PhD students, published more than 20 papers in peer-reviewed journals. He has authored a book on ethics in science, education, and governance, which was the first formal document in India on the subject. He is the fellow of all the Indian Science Academies, the World Academy of Sciences, and the Geological Society of London. He has been a recipient of several prestigious fellowships like the Ford Foundation Fellowship and Humboldt Foundation Fellowship. Sir, we are happy to have you amongst us to deliver your talk on this National Science Day celebration. 
uh, madam thank you so much can you you have to i will let me use slides from your end i am not able to upload my slides so can you upload my slides madam yeah we'll do that yes it can be done from the room deepika can you do that uh in the meantime i'll start a uh, very good morning professor sarkar ministry of uh, education minister of science uh, state for ministry of education professor nageshwar rao professor varma Professor Banerjee, Professor Pandey, Professor Bhaskar. My compliments to you on the National Science Day. What a great day to celebrate. As also my compliments to IGNO for a wonderful track record of educating younger colleagues in India. My wife was one of the beneficiaries of this institution. So I have a special connect with you. Dr. Sarkar had kindly recalled many of the stalwarts of the Indian science, and it was very good to recall them on this occasion. I'd like to add a few more names, to make the list complete. And that would I like to include Professor G. N. Ramchandran, who almost should have gotten a Nobel Prize. Professor D. S. Kothari, who built the defense structure. Professor Ramanujan, you know him very well. And uh, Satish Dhawan, who really took up from where Vikram Sarabhai left and created the space program that it is today. I must also thank Dr. Bhaskar <coughs> for inviting me first, then persuading me to give a talk, then kindly choosing the topic of what I should be talking about it, and then finally approving the slides that I'm going to show you. He is a esteemed colleague. And I'm here because I respect his science and his, his intellectual acumen as a scientist. What you see on the screen today is a, well, I'm from Gujarat right now. So what you see is Gujarati Thali, which you all know is very famous for his varieties. And in the same context, I'd like to present to you some aspects of science, humanity, sustainability, and our responsibility in academics through this talk. I'm not going to talk very complex issues. I'm going to talk very simple issues. So you can sit back and relax. And I will like to tell you some stories on the way so that you understand and my message that I would like to give you. <clears throat> the next slide, please. <laughs> One of the important thing, a new word has been coined in English language is fubbing. Fubbing is when you look at your cell phone when somebody is talking. And I hope and I request you that kindly grant me 45 minutes to be able to listen to my, my thoughts and maybe there's something to take home. Next slide, please. <clears throat> well, there was a man called Charles Sherrington who won the Nobel Prize on his understanding of the neurology of brain. Once he did a very complex operation on a monkey. His brain was dissected and something was introduced. And at, Dr. Sherrington could not sleep in the night and he wanted to see how the monkey was doing. So at midnight, he went to the lab and with the idea that he will not at all disturb the monkey who might be sleeping or whatever, he wanted to observe the monkey through a keyhole. And he was, when he was trying to observe the monkey, he realized that there was a monkey on the other side trying to observe him. And he was shocked. So friends, as we observe others and judge them, we usually forget that at that very moment, we are also being judged by them through our actions and deeds. And we do not know whose judgment is right. It's a very important lesson for us that whatever we need to uh, do today in academics is being judged by the society directly or indirectly through our actions indeed. 
and uh, they'll come back to this later. The ethical question here was, while Sherrington got a Nobel Prize for his work on the monkey, what did the monkey get except being killed? So we need to be careful about and speak for those who are less fortunate, those who cannot speak for themselves and take care of them. And ethics stated simply is the respect for others' rights. Next slide, please. One of the questions I would request you to think about and ask, and we never ask ourselves some questions. What is it that we want to do with our life? What we think is our role in the society? Is it only to earn money, produce children, and then eventually go, which animals also do the same? So why we are superior to animals? How have we made the world a better place as an individual? Have we impacted the people, other people in a positive manner? What is one thing that you will be remembered for if you go? Can you identify one thing that the world you think the world will remember you for, for a positive action? How many people you gave hope for their better future? We also need to think about why teaching profession has lost its respect. And lastly, did you ever give yourself space and time to think about yourself in the future? We have become so busy in our lives as teachers, as uh, persons working in the offices or whatever, that we have no time to sit back and reflect on which direction are we going and what are our responsibilities towards others. I think that's a very important point that we need to find time for ourselves also as much as we need to find time for others. The next slide, please. You must have seen this film, The Pale Blue Dot by Carl Sagan. And if you see that white dot in the yellow line in between, the sun line, is the Earth. In the whole scheme of sun, this is the tiny dot is Earth. And on this, you have your Mercedes to mentions to whatever you have. And that we must realize that in the whole scheme of the world, the whole scheme of the universe, we are a tiny dot. We are, we should be happy that we are unique, being intelligent beings, but it is also, it should make us humble in realizing that still we are very micro, micro, micro dot in the universe. And it's our tininess which should make us humble in whatever we do. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Now, if I look at the broader canvas of science and society, we are need to be looking at policies and the decision making for future societies. That's what we are supposed to be doing. Now, if we look at politicians, they have a five year time frame of elections. So their vision, their actions would be limited only to five year time scale. The bureaucrats, on the other hand, have only a two year time scale because by that time they are all ready to be transferred to next department. It is only the teachers and academics who have the luxury and the privilege of having a long term view of planning for the future society. And this is what I'm going to uh, like to emphasize upon that. What is it? How is it we can impact the future societies? by creating people who will take us forward. Nowadays, and I'll come to it in a minute, we have technological challenges, which are now accelerating. So how we handhold the entire society to go further? How do we support them? And I will elaborate on it in a minute. There are issues of scientific temper, scientific humanity, and social change. We need to be worried about. And there are lots of inequities that are appearing. And again, I'll come to it, both in financial space, in knowledge space and internet space. Now, if you look at it, I've shown you two pictures. And I hope, I'm sure you'll remember the recall, the one with the lower down, which is Albert Einstein and Ravindana Tagore. 
On the top, you may or may not remember that uh, these are Roosevelt and Churchill. People would forget politicians, but people will remember academicians because their impact is long term. And Einstein is one example, Ravindranath Tagore is another example. So we need to introspect on what is our role as teachers. What is the value of our science? What's the value of our teaching? And can we move from a preoccupation from ourselves to our preoccupation with society? We are too obsessed with one promotion, one increment, one transfer, rather than looking at our larger role in the society as a transformer of society. Is a teacher should ask a question today, can we change the narrative from a mindless competition through marks or whatever to meaningful collaboration by inculcating ethics and empathy through education and personal example. I think it's important for us to be the vehicles for social change that we have not been able to do in the recent time. And that's why the teaching as a profession has lost its steam. Next slide, please. So here is my start my proper talk. And the question that I'm asking is, you must have seen the movie called Jamtara where people used to hack the accounts. So how do we safeguard the future societies that this old man does not get hacked by the technological challenges, be it in economic space, be it in health space that his kidney gets removed, to a young child or whose future is as secure as we have seen it. And I remind you of a quotation by Gil Metz, the past cannot see you, but future is listening to you. So what we do today is more important than what we, our ancestors did in past. I think it's important our future would be determined. The future of our children will be determined by what we do today. The next slide, please. This talk is based on introspection and I'm essentially introspecting myself. So the questions that I'm asking, I ask myself is a question I'm going to pose to you also. And it's a synthesis of published articles, talks, papers, and my own thoughts in between. And these are my personal thoughts, which I see is writing on the wall. And if you don't see them, I think we are in for great trouble times. Indian science surely has made great strides, but to quote Robert Frost, there are miles to go. And there are many people whom, through whom interaction I've learned. I've listed them and there are many more. Every day I learn from everybody. So that's how I look at it. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. If you look at human evolution, it should be realized that only humans have the capabilities to build societies and thereby build social structures, build rules and morality. No other animal in the world can do that. We can build large societies, we can build townships, we can build countries, we can build nations, we can build regions, we can talk about global village. We have the capacity to have a mental construct of these structures. And that is what makes us stronger than any other animal that we have it. In the earlier times, when the numbers were less, it was the physical power that man needed to protect himself against animals and against calamities. Then things improved 10,000 years ago. It was more of how many cattle you had, how many cattle you could domesticate, and how much farmland you had. Then man became greedy. We had the size of army and the land was important to control the world. And the kings were allowed to marry probably so that they have large number of children for security and for working in their fields. Simple as that. With the improvement in technology in the 17th century, 16th century, the quality and the finance for weapons came up. The British came to India and overpowered India because they had superior weapons and guns, which we did not have. Then came a phase of mass production in the late 17th century, 18th century. We had more money for technology, which brought in more wealth. 
we had more uh, land, labor, and capital was used to increase your control over the world. The last 200 years, technology has been the driving force for <coughs> more capital, more power, and even science. We are driven by technology and science today. And there are fights going on for control on resources, especially if you know control on rare earths is a big thing in Africa. There are wars being fought because India and China would need more rare earth material for their cell phones. And niobium is a very rare metal. Now, in the rate of change of technology has increased, automation has come in. And that requires there is a quality and agility of the future human resource will also change. We cannot be living and then at the same pace as we have done in the past. But it's certain that knowledge will be power in the year century to come. Next slide, please. Every country, every human being wants to go up to Maslow's triangle. Maslow triangle identify three important needs of a human being of a society. One is a basic need, which is of safety of food, water, hunger, animals, warmth, cold, heat, all is the first need. You need to have those security. Then you get psychological needs, which are met by families. You have your friendship, you have your sisters, your brothers, which gives you an emotional well-being. And then you come to a level when these two are met, only then man has the time and the inclination to be creative. And only then new things emerge, new innovations occur. So how do we make sure that everybody of our colleagues, everybody in India, everybody in the world goes up the Maslow's triangle to a level that he can be creative for his good, <clears throat> for the good of society. Next slide, please. There are three kinds of securities we need. Freedom from want, food, hunger, freedom from fear, and freedom from dignity. We need to have dignity as well. So we need to have economic conditions, employment, income. We need to have a social political system, which will ensure law and order, education, justice, freedom, health, culture, privacy, whatever you talk about. And you have environmental condition, air, water, soil, resource, climate, others. You should have a conducive environment to live. Now, these are the three things we need to meet. And the UN goals for sustainable development essentially deal with these securities of three kinds. Next slide, please. So the grand challenges that we have in terms of UN Sustainable Development Goal, where education and especially geosciences would play an important role. We need energy, we need an uh, environment, food, health, poverty, security, and water, and all of them needs geosciences. The issues are of climate change, globalism, what's the local traditions, Controlling the population growth, we are already 7 billion. Yesterday, today, it may be 8 billion. We should have a sustainable lifestyle. And what is sustainable lifestyle is an important question. We need to say what is sustainable. What is sustained in America may not be sustainable in India. So how do we make sure that people are at some level of Maslow's triangle? Cyber issues, the biological wars are on. And how do we safeguard our people who are in the village? How does he get safeguarded from his account being hacked and he being de denuded of all his wealth? Poverty and inequality has increased, not decreased. Though we talk about global village, and I'll show you an example just now. We have to talk in terms of ethics, and I'll come to in a moment. Ethics is a very important issue to talk about. There are issues of extinction. This pandemic was one extinction. We lost 5 million people or 7 million people in one go automation and will change lifestyles and bring in new diseases. How do we handle them? Technological exploits, internet of things is good, 
but if your account is had, hacked, then it's bad. Pandemics we talked about. And overall, all these changes have altered the social fabric. The global connect has changed. We are a global village, but we are personally disconnected to the level that a husband and wife share a joke through an internet rather than telling one to one. And in this world, fake news abounds 90% of the news we get. And we have to be guarding against it. And I, I have a reason to point this out to you. Next slide. In 1980s, Willy Brandt, the German chancellor after he retired, was asked to head a session. And he drew a, a line, which is on the left side, a lower cartoon. He called it Brandt line. And this was drawn on the basis of GDP of the countries. And all those countries below the line, a dark blue black line, were poorer countries. And all above were richer countries. And the idea was that, can we shift this line to south? Now, if you look at the Human Development Index of the year 2020, almost the same line exists. And more importantly, if you look at the COVID vaccine as of 18 January figure that I have, I could have taken a new one, but makes a difference. Again, you will rise that the trend follows the front line. So there is a world that has a problem of plenty, and there is a world which has a problem of survival. And how do we create an equitable society in making sure that our less fortunate brothers and sisters in the world in the South have basic amenities. And what do we do as a role as a teacher is the next question I'll try to address to. Next, please. Another issue that has happened is the issue of trust in science and science and technology interface. Till the 17th and the 18th and the 19th century, it was known that the science helped the society but there was a golden rule that it will not harm the man of today. And the effect were largely local. We had the steam engine, we had the train, we had all these services. The effect was local. There were no large scale effects of these technological changes. They were essentially to help a man be a motor, be an engine, be a... Then excessive use of technology came in this 18th century, 19th century that we had the power to impact the world in an unending manner. <clears throat> an unending manner is one of the simplest example I can give you is climate change, that we are now talking in geology of a people called Anthropocene, a event, geological event, where the effects by the humans are of the same order of magnitude as has happened in the geological past. And their impact is not instantaneous, but they will stay for 20, 30, 100 years, 200 years. So you are looking at impact of humans, impact of technology that has a far reaching consequence on the societies which we do not even know of. It could be autonomous weapons, it could be cryobog engineer and whatever else is there. So we are now entering a stage where we are impacting future societies for without their knowing it, without their participating in it. So the magnitude of harm that we are going to do for the future society, the calls for the breadth of vigilance, we have to be careful, we have to be responsible. And it's only the academicians who can assess this change and handhold the societies for its well-being. It's very important that if the trust in science has to be gained, it has to be through academicians, people who do science, people who do teach, people who communicate science. And it is already mentioned by a man called Quare in 2002 that we need to think of a framework of ethics of men and machines of today, tomorrow, and very far future. If I do a genetic engineering today, I have no clue how that will shape up 
hundred years in now. It may be that everybody is deformed because of that, that engineering that I did for curing or something. We have to be very careful. And I think the academicians have to build in these things, these messages in their lectures to ensure that we prepare our students for the future in a better manner. The so next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm reminded, I'll not read this, but I'm reminded of Pandit Nehru's two statements, which he wrote in his book, Discovery of India. And I like the word scientific temper. Essentially, it says the refusal to accept anything without testing and trial, and the reliance on observed fact, and the temper of a free man. Until a man is free from the encumbrances of the mess, until the man comes from the top of the Maslow's triangle, he cannot be creative. And scientific humanism is the use of science for welfare and future of mankind in a rational, beneficial manner. Scientific human, and this is what we have to teach to our students. What is scientific temper? What is scientific humanism? And I think it's becoming more relevant than ever before today. Next slide, please. What are the immediate issues that the world faces, India included? Our human living index has gone down. We are essentially looking at redeployment of more than half a billion people. How do we gainfully employ these people? We have to look at the employment in informal versus formal sector. The formal sector is shrinking, the informal sector, how do we find people employable? What are the ways people can be employed? Now we need to be thinking about solutions of that. I don't think anybody of us in academia has ever been thought about it. Tomorrow, if the Prime Minister calls us and asks us, what is your roadmap for the future of India in terms of academics, in terms of job creation, I don't think we have a roadmap created. We should be thinking about it. Our scientific output, though the numbers have increased, but its impact is low. Our teaching is suboptimal, you have known that, and our students are quite often unemployable. And I was told by an industrialist in Gujarat, they came to me to meet me as a president of the Gujarat Science Academy and tell me that I should do some something that our students become employable and that the local students could be hired by companies which are on high-end technology. And he said it's one reason that Gujarat is not attracting high-end technological industries. Instrumentation is another problem and we are slaves in the technological space. Today, if China says, we'll not supply you computers, Japan says, we'll not supply you computers, what do we do? All our economics, all our railways, all our finance, all our defense collapses, all our R&D, all our instruments, all are based on computers built in China and Japan. How do we do that? Do we have a roadmap? Can we do something else? Our leadership based in the younger generation is low. And you may recall that there was a time the whole country knew who was the director of BARC. Today, we don't know it. I think we need to be careful about it. our visibility of science and scientists has to increase. How do we prepare a rational society? It's a question we need to be addressing every day, asking our, your tea room should be full of these debates where we ask, how do we do that? How do we change the society? Another question is who should fund basic science? Right now we depend on only on the government, but that cannot go on. And I can see signatures of government wanting industry or philanthropy to come in, but it's not happened. An important question that we need to know, is there an ecosystem for excellence? Would an Abhijit Banerjee earn a Nobel Prize if in India? Answer is no, because not only you need to have resources, but you need to have an ecosystem that challenges your talent every day to go to a higher level. And are we as academia able to achieve those is a question we need to respect. Next slide, please. There's a great debate going on on the focus of what is the should be the focus of scientific research. Is it basic versus applied? Is it should be light bearing where you don't expect the fruits today, but in 100 years time, or a fruit bearing that is applied science, I'll get a product tomorrow. 
and I believe that a judicious balance has to be maintained. And as much as we have to service the basic sciences, we have to service applied, but more to the basic because there where the seeds of future technologies will be grown. Second question we need to address is, does the science link to society only by technology? Only because I have technology, I know about science, or there is something more to it. I think there's much more to science in a way of thinking, way of analyzing, way of uh, the whole scientific process of hypothesis, testing, reasons, arguments is to be inculcated. There's a trust deficit right now. You must have seen that in pandemic, there's a vaccine hesitancy. And that comes because people don't trust science. And it's not a small amount, maybe 50%, 40% of people are not trusting science, not trusting vaccine. And the trust deficit has to be addressed to us by us talking in classes. And similarly in climate change and whatever issues. There's also an issue of credibility of scientists and academicians. Who should manage science? There's an argument and there are big articles on those that scientists cannot manage science because they are party to it. So there is a conflict of interest. So there should be a bureaucrat or a businessman to manage science. Now, will that be a fair statement? Similarly, an academician. Sure, who should be a vice chancellor? A chancellor should be a question to be asked. Should be an academician, should be a businessman, should be an IAS officer, who should? And what will happen if an outsider non-professional manages science or education. We need to think about it. These are happening. We see these happening. And we need to articulate our thoughts on these issues. What is the future of jobs? And I will come to you in a minute. That future of jobs will be a question which world will find very hard to answer, India included. Then I've talked about the new technology, new ethics I've talked about. Do we have the data for national growth? Do we know how many doctors per million, how many scientists per million, how many teachers per million we need? See, right now we have areas where there were colleges opened and now there are no takers. Engineering colleges, for example, 50% of Why should that happen? How much of resources is wasted in this? But if you have a proper plan that ensures a constant regulated supply of people, and it's true of every single area in the world, okay? Uh, then perhaps the country's future is well served. We have to have a plan. We have to have a robust plan of what kind of it. And the next is, what is our social responsibility? Next slide, please. Next. Hello. Can I get the next slide, please? Hello? Deepika? No, Shubhalakshini is doing that. I think the, again the connection has gone there. Yeah. There is no connection. It's okay. It's, it's just it now, if you look at how science has grown, and this I will recommend you read this article by Vane Varpush, The Science of Endless Frontier After the World War. He was appointed as an advisor to the US government. And he said, science has to be a free uh, play of free intellect. Leave the people free and they will play with it. We don't ask questions, but one day you'll find that they'll bring new things to you. And that has happened very well in America. American system has thrived and survived because of research and new innovations that came out of research. The whole obsession with more number of institutions, more papers, more PhDs, implying well-being is not correct. What we need is quality. In the ancient times, scientists uh, were, were essentially, science essentially enabled the spirit of freedom, creativity, dignity, gave some relief from pain through medicines, gave comforts and imparted training into humility. One of the important things science does is, it essentially tells us that how much is we do not understand. More you learn, you realize how less you know. So I think that's a training in humility that is a most important lesson you get in science. 
And in the past, till recently, till the 90s, till the scientists were taken as the decoders or interpreters of natures through the language of mathematics. If you could write an equation, why a fan works and why a galaxy moves around, that's all mathematics. And once you write mathematics, there are no ifs and buts. These are exact equations, gives you exact answers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Yeah, now the changing perception of science I like to bring to you. If you look at George Washington's address in 18, 1789, he said, there is nothing which can better deserve your patronage than the promotion of science and culture. That was a president's address. The next was in 1969, 200 years later. Fermilab has nothing to do directly with defending your country, except to make it worth defending. That the Fermi lab is so precious to the American country, America, that it's worth defending it. I think that's a great. And now if you look at in 2013, <coughs> again in America, the Congress is entitled to wonder whether the scientists are the geese that lay golden eggs or another group of pigs at the trough. The whole narrative of science, the whole value system for science has changed. And I will recommend you to read those two books. These slides will be available to you to read these books and you realize the kind of impact the science has had and the kind of thoughts people have now. Right now, I need immediate gratification from science, which is not coming. The second thing important to realize about science is that science is never exact. It's always incremental understanding of a phenomenon. So whenever we talk, we talk with errors. And those errors are the ones which nobody likes. Everybody wants 100% precise, which is science allows us to say that there cannot be a 100% answer to anything in the world. And it's where the dichotomy occurs. Next, please. I'll skip this, but essentially I like to say that there are many corrections. I will request you to read them. And one of the things you say is that science is a beautiful lie that has corrupted the scientific enterprise. How far the scientists should be allowed to roam free from the demands of the society that fund this is something we need to think about it. Churchill in way back in, in the 45, he said, society cannot be but grateful to science for these gifts which increase the pleasures, reduce the planes of human existence. But scientific and material advance does not imply moral advancement. So he had caution about moral advancement. Then we have to be careful about these statements. These are important statements that we need to debate ourselves about. Next slide, please. I'll skip this, but I'll skip this because I don't, I think I'm running short of time. So I'll skip this, but I'll read, request you to read this slide. And these three books are very important. The next slide, please. I'll come to the history of Indian science. I think just to give you, since it is Science Day, I thought I'll include this. And Dr. Kochar of Chandigarh, formerly in Estates, has done a very elegant analysis of the Indian science. And he identified three phases, 1895 to 1945, where you heard all the names of both Kothari, Raman, Ramchandra, Saha, they're all potential Nobel laureates. They were low on resources, high on ideas, high competence, total confidence, no government funding. There were no government funding. As was mentioned by the, uh, by the minister, Raman worked with the instrument of two, 300, 400 rupees. Everybody had a focus on teaching and everybody took a job if he was allowed to teach. I know of D.S. Kothari accepting, becoming the advisor to the government of India defense on two counts. Firstly, that he will be allowed to teach. And secondly, he will allow to stay in the campus where he was having a house of a professor, not a big house in the central Delhi, but in the campus. The focus was on teaching. And each one of them, small as lecturers or a professor, had a vision of nation, science and society. And I may remind you that is Meghna Sa's article in 1929, in an Allahabad newsletter, 
laid the foundation of the two science academies, the National Academy of Sciences in India and the Indian National Science Academy that we have today. A young man of 29, having a vision of how science should interface. And I think all of you should aspire to be a Saha, a Kothari, in having a vision of science and its interface with the society. The next slide, please. Then came the international phase. We became independent. And we thought with the intellectual capital that we have, we will be next to America in terms of scientific equipment. We built Tata Institute, CSIR, DA, ISRO, National Labs were built in a big manner. CSIR was another one which really was the key to our vaccine success now. It took 45 years for CSIR to be there to help us when we needed vaccine. So investment in the 40s and 50s paid off in the 2020. We hope to be the next to US, but never happened. We were industrializing, we were building industries, but it was hoping they'll become global. Somewhere we lost the plot. Teaching was still a plus. A first ranker of a university will always get a job of a lecturer. He was happy about it. Science was still for scientific curiosity. No questions were asked if we took the money. We had the luxury of free play for free interact. The next phase, 1995 onwards, <clears throat> was when it became globalization. There, the whole thing changed. We were essentially, our economy became dominated by IT and service sector. Economy boomed, but can a nation survive on a service sector? If somebody does not want your services tomorrow, your economy goes bust. You cannot survive on a service sector. And that was a misplaced priority that we gave to uh, instant uh, riches through a service sector. But consequently, what happened was the science was no longer an attractive career option. Teaching was not attractive and thereby manpower base went down, leadership crisis happened, and there were increasing political interferences that happened. Funding was reasonable for us in science but we were not using the resources optimally. There were no synergies. Everybody wanted his lab, and that was a mistake that we did. We were happy to carry fashionable global science, the global chain science or global consortium of some kind, because the ease of funding. I don't have to justify the science for this funding, but any global program of this kind is only for data creations, not for a conceptual development. Very rarely this happens, and that's why we had a comfort of increasing publications, but a discomfort of losing out on a conceptual space. Science was therefore a data-driven science. And even now, most of the science that we have is data-driven. I have a machine, I'll produce some data, write something. And my building a lab was essentially an ownership instrument that I can buy through a grant. That culture came, instrument culture But I have built something new, was lost. And that was a negative thing that happened. We had so much money that we could outright buy technology, but none, no scientific innovations have ever occurred. And mark my words, no scientific ever occurred from commercial instruments. Commercial instruments have to be tweaked to a higher level of performance to test out a rare idea. And that's where we lost out. We had a large number of data. We had a large number of publications. Our publications are increasing. But our impact is decreasing because we are essentially creating data sets, nothing more. We also forgot that the society will increasingly expect more from science. We need to give solutions for hazards, solutions for uh, floods, solutions for earthquakes, solutions for whatever, uh, health in real time. Were we prepared? No. We forgot to assess the value of our science. I'm, everybody says I have so many papers, but nobody evaluates what is the value of my science, how much I have created a dent in the intellectual space. And I think that's where we have lost out. We have too many awards and rewards that everybody is after one award to the other. I mean, I am also beneficiary of awards, but I find this all futile. Because at the end of the day, what really satisfies you is 
the real worth of science that one does, the real worth of students you produce. That is your satisfaction. And the last is, are we using our resources optimally? Yes or no, we will have to think about it. Next slide, please. The areas of concern we have right now is the rate of change of internet, IT, AI, ML, IoT, are accelerating. Every day is new technology. The future of jobs, if you go to the next slide, you'll find there's all these jobs of healthcare, insurance, architect, journalists, financial services, teachers, human resources, they will go in the next 10 years time. All will be automated. And all will die, jobs will be high end technology jobs, big data analysis, blockchain, virtual. So where will these people go? I think the teaching also will have to think about where will the teachers go? Where the financial services people will go, we do not know. The next slide, please. Secure jobs will not be there. You will be hired only for a particular skill based job. And that's it. So every single job would be a skill base, time bound, one day, 10 days, 20 days, 50 days job. And that will require that you have skills, communication, punctuality, perfection and preparation for your jobs. So our students will have to be trained in these skills now that they are agile enough to keep on reinventing themselves in terms of their skills and perfection to do that. Next slide, please. So education makes I has a problem that our minds are hackable now. A chota sa message on a on a internet on a WhatsApp can raise fire in the society. Whether it will right or not, we don't think we react first and think later. And that's very serious problem. The second thing that has happened and brought to fore is a pandemic is that we are every country has two countries in them. One which earlier it was wealthy and non-wealthy, now it is our internet haves and internet have nots. Those are economically rich, can get education and e-linking education, and others who are not. And 80% of India is uneducated today, and they have lost two years of education. Whatever we do, our web lectures are only reaching to 10 or 20% of the students. All the students in villages, and now you see of uh, suicides being carried out by students because they don't have an internet connection or a web phone. We are connected and disconnected. The entropy of the human mind is increasing. Our social fabric is also increasing. The local issues blow up as global concerns we have talked about. And you would have seen a small accident here can be an animal rights uh, issue elsewhere in the world. And we have no answers. So you see these slides I've shown you the good part of a classroom and a bad part of a classroom. Good part of a, and I think you need to know we are looking at two worlds existing simultaneously. And increasingly, the gradient will change and there will be more of a violent society that will take place. Next slide, please. How much time can I take? Hello? Uh, maybe, sir, two, three more minutes. Okay, then I will just uh, go then. Okay, go on. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I cannot control the slide. Yeah, this is another part which has happened is that uh, Daniel Kruger effect. It is that uh, we often see a message on the WhatsApp and we think we understand everything. But we are on the peak of Mount Stupid. So we a bit know more and then we realize we don't know, don't know anything and go further. Now, most of our reactions are when we are on the peak of Mount Stupid. And this is courtesy WhatsApp University. And I think, as Einstein said, any fool can know something is happening, but the point is to understand. So the next slide, please. The other thing which has happened is, if you look at uh, knowledge and uh, uh, of individual versus the knowledge of society. Earlier they were saying, I knew everything in the village and I knew my decisions were based on the information, the needs in the village. Now, the world has become a global village, and my knowledge is limited because I can only learn so much. So there is a large gap between the knowledge of a person and a knowledge in the society. And then you make a data, uh, make a judgment about the society. 
So we are now making a judgment without having any clue of what is existing in the world. And that fake information abounds in that. And that's why knowledge and decision making has become a very tricky situation. And we need to create system and minds who can assimilate, not understand, assimilate the gist of knowledge and use them judiciously to that. Now I'll skip one full section because I don't have time. But if you go down, I'll keep mentioning because I have only a few minutes left. Yeah, well, just go back, go back. Go back one more. <laughs> yeah, this is an important slide and it shows that millions of people, uh, no, uh, number of people per million versus the GDP. And those uh, countries which are uh, tech leaders are on the right hand side where there are five to 6,000 people per million as scientists and about three to 5% of the G uh, GDP being spent on technology and science education. India is at a healthy 200 people, 250 people per million and about 0.7% or 0.6% now of GDP. So we have a long way to go to be called as a developing country because we are in a state of tragedy of commons. Everybody wants to use science. Everybody wants to use the riches of science, but nobody wants to uh, pay for it. And it's a tragedy of commons, famously called a tragedy of commons, that everybody wants to use it, but nobody wants. It's like a park, a social park. Everybody wants to walk in the park, but nobody wants to maintain the park. Science is at the same level. And there are many other issues I could talk an hour on this, but I'll go, go down. Go to next, please. Skip, skip it. Next. Next. Remember that Time magazine and the Indian magazines have put 100 best names in the world as a powerful Indians or powerful world. Not one educationist, not one scientist is in them. And that speaks about. There is a network issue again, I think, Professor Singhvi. We can't yeah. hear you. I'm all right. I can hear you, madam. No, no, it is audible. It is audible, sir. Sorry. Anyway, it's so audible. I think, is okay now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in this time, 100 or, uh, yes, or now the we can hear. years magazine, not 1%, one person of Indian uh, uh, of science or technology is listed as a powerful person. And that is an elegant commentary on what is the status of science in India and globally. Now, we are underpaid, underrepresented. There is always a reservation of all kinds, but why not for academics? Why there are no seats for academics in the parliament? So that our voice is equally heard. We are only let out and used when there is a crisis. When there was a subject of epidemics was there, nobody took it. But today, after COVID, everybody wants to look at epidemics uh, people. We are only op uh, brought out in the open when they need it. I think that has to change. And we have to have a voice to change that. And we have to develop a mechanism that we inform policies from a short-term agenda to a long-term uh, future. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Am I gone? I you are there. Request, you are there. You are there. Uh, I'll also request you. I mean, madam, I'll take another five minutes. Don't mind it because monkey baat kar raun, to karne dije usko. If you don't mind, madam, is okay. Uh, I think we should. We should, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Okay. So now, what happens is uh, in Africa there are. Uh, areas where they have crocodiles but they also put these crocodile kids when they're born into a pond of one meter by one meter or one feet by one feet depending on the requirement give them minimal food so then they end up with the bonsai crocodile and these are crocodile are put like a fish pond for fun the same crocodile that was could have been 12 feet long is now eight inches long and we are doing exactly the same in producing bonsai teachers, bonsai scientists. We have put people under so many control 
everybody has to sign every single paper that a teacher is not trusted, a scientist is not trusted for any decision making. And 50% of the time goes by a teacher, whether it's in a CSIR lab or a IIT lab, anywhere, goes in approvals. I think we have to come out of that and start trusting our younger colleagues for the decision making, because if you don't trust their decision making, how can you trust their science? On one hand, you expect them to do great in terms of science. On the other hand, we want to control them. That is not, these are two incompatible extreme variables that cannot go together. I request you to introspect and remove as much as, as burdens on the kids so that they have all the time to do science without having to worry. As leaders, as directors, as vice chancellors, as group leaders, our role should be to facilitate science and the younger students and younger colleagues rather than to control them. I think that mindset has to change if you want to talk in terms of India growing in science. In the US, any, every faculty member is free to do what he likes. They only ask him a question of five years hence, and that's what I did. I got in PRL where I work. We only had 10 year review. And if, if I failed in that 10 year review, I failed, that's it. And I don't get money for five years or 10 years, but I was free to go where I liked. I never had to seek any permissions. I could order anything on phone and it will come and then the intent goes. And that's how we worked. So I think that culture of trust between each other, between superior and junior has to be brought back. And I think I urge you all to think about it harder. The next slide, please. I think I'll conclude in two minutes. We can assume that uh, all is well. We don't have to worry about too much, but I think there's an enormous amount of social responsibility will there. And I have a section on teaching, which I'll not go into it. Can you go further down now? But I leave the slide, so maybe you can see that. Go ahead, go ahead. I talk about social responsibility of a scientist, so you can go ahead. Please move on. Move on. Keep moving. I think this is just go back, just one thing. It's important, uh, this will probably be the last slide I like to show and then I go to the end. Last slide that, you know, you take a drop of water. It could be you, could be your student, could be anybody. If that drop stays on the leaf, it can shine like a pearl. If you leave it there, it will uh, evaporate into thin air and you will never know it existed. If it goes in the ocean, it's a part of the ocean, you will not, never know it existed. Now it is for us to find up our leaves where we can shine like a pearl or help our colleagues to find a leaf. And it shines like a pearl. Or be lost in the wilderness. It's our choice. And I think we need to be careful in how we mentor our students in creating their career choices. I have lots of slides, but I'll skip those now. I will. I'm sorry I'm late. Can you go down? Go down, go down, don't go down, go down, yes, please go, 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 yeah, but go back, go back to the shake. I'll have one more, uh, one, uh, go back with the shake, uh, namaste slide, go down, yes, go, go back one. Yes, I think we always do namaste, but we have never understood the meaning of namaste. Namaste is that I respect the spirit in you. I respect your status in the society as much as I, I respect mine. I honor your rights. The science teaches you the laws that govern the world. And if you ever drive on the wrong side of the road, you are no longer a scientist, you are no longer a teacher. And I think that science faith, that culture, that you are a scientist 24 by 7, implies that you follow all the norms of life. Be on the road, be in the house, be, 
as you would expect others to follow. If you take a shortcut, be sure, tell yourself you are no longer a scientist, no longer an academician. Come down to the, I think that's very important part, which we, we just don't take into account that everything that we do today, every, in the day, is a part of our character. And we cannot be a split personality that between nine to five, I'm an academician and then I'm what I am. No, that doesn't work. Next slide, please. Go, go further. Go, go further. Go down, please. Go down. Go down. Yes. The world is a, just one, one back, please. One, one back. Can you go back? Can, yes. World is a very dicey place. And you cannot realize where the man is. Is he on the highest point or the lowest point? You will never know where you are in the world. All what you can do is to do your things rightly. And the world will automatically then start following you and bring you to the highest pedestal. Otherwise, you could be thinking you're on the highest pedestal, but you may be at the lowest point and vice versa. So the important thing that you need to guard against is your perspective about things, your attitude, your dedication and direction. If they are right, you are okay in the world, otherwise you're not. The so next slide, please. There are millions when you go home, you must have seen them. You have born without hope, without life, living, no house, no food. And I think we need to spare a thought for them that if they are not well, we are not well as a country. And it is our social responsibility that we use our science 100%, 24 by 7, to make sure that some of them at least become better people. And if in IGNO, if you have 5,000 or 50,000 students, if everybody commits 10 hours per year to train 10 people, you have talked in terms of thousands of people being trained without an effort. So IGNU should have a room for social commitment to science, where every student, every teacher takes 10 minutes more, uh, 10 people, uh, trains 10 people out of his own experience, be it computer sciences, be it typing, be it whatever. I think the world will be a different place. Thank you so much. And I thank you for the honor you have given me. I'm sorry I exceeded my time, but I thought I'll share some of my thoughts. Thank you so much. That brings to the end of this talk. Did you have Mr. Singhvi, Musings on Academia with the scientific social responsibility for a sustainable future. Now I uh, put this uh, floor, I keep this floor, I keep this floor open for discussions. If any, you can raise your hands. Professor Jha. Sir, Professor Jha. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Komalika. I first of all congratulate uh, Professor Singhvi for such a uh, lucid and uh, nice presentation about broadly the role and responsibilities of teachers as well as the status of science in our country since 1885 and so on. Thank you very much, sir, for such a nice presentation. And uh, first of all, I would like to request you to give us the privilege of uh, looking at all your slides which uh, due to paucity of time, you could not uh, elaborate upon. Uh, whatever you could share was really very illuminating and interesting. I have requested all the slides to share yeah. with everybody. everybody. I, I have and the copy, I will, I will share. I will share. Secondly, sir, I would will, I will like uh, your uh, comments on two points, uh, which uh, I was listening to. First is about uh, Mosley's triangle. You talked about the basic uh, needs and then uh, ultimately the self-actualization needs of every human being. Right? So 
I was just wondering that our country uh, is, uh, we can say almost all countries divided into, the population can be divided into um, certain at first level and some number, very small number at the top level. That is very acute uh, problem in our country, so to say. The large population is uh, still struggling to meet the uh, first two uh, lower pyramids of that uh, triangle. So in such a situation, it becomes very difficult uh, to prioritize what should be prioritized. And you very rightly said, your own experience of PRL, that you are free to do whatever you want to do for 10 years and it will be reviewed. And you can contrast it with the situation in other institutions where every day, every morning, evening teachers are busy signing this form and that form. Ultimately, which all says that they are again saying again and again that I'm honest. So this contradictory situation you have very rightly highlighted. So that is one point I would like you to comment on. Second is uh, about uh, the science and politics. You very rightly said that, uh, uh, see, whatever the achievements of science are, but uh, how it is to be used, it, 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 it starts from the use of atom bomb and quantum theory. And right now, with the pandemic situation has become very grave, where uh, the decision of using the fruits of science, I personally feel that scientists have no say in that. When it is a political decision about the direction in which science should work and how its fruits will be used for the global society, humankind. If that is a political decision, then uh, what is what what a scientist should do? And it applies to pandemic, it applies to vaccine, it applies to climate change, it applies to nuclear submarine and whatnot. So you sir, are uh, to, cut, to, cut, to cut my point short. On these two points, I would like your comments. I, you asked wonderful questions, wonderful questions, and I thank you for asking because I could not spend more time on them. First is the question of signing forms. We must know what is our basic objective. Our basic objective is to teach and empower his teacher to work well. And if I don't trust my teacher in his daily conduct, I better not have him as teacher. You cannot control a human being. If I if I'm sincere, I will be sincere irrespective of whether you check me or not. If I'm insincere, I'll find a way to do it. I think 99% of the Indian people are honest. I, I believe so, though India is known to be a girl, but I believe people are good. And if you give them a sense of trust, some people will misuse it. So don't worry. Keep strong penal uh, offense, but let others be free of the income uh, headache of this kind of thing. I think I have seen people struggling to get tour programs approved. What for? Why should a director spend all his time approving a tour program? This is a, or why should a director approve a certain instrument? Because the person who wants it knows more than anybody else does it. I think we need to have that respect and trust on our colleagues. And it starts from top to the bottom. You trust your junior, he trusts his junior, he trusts the lab assistant, he trusts the peon. That sense of trust has to come in, in our system. We have lost that. I think that's very important. And the trust will come, and I must tell you, the trust will come when you share the excitement of science. And everybody is assured that he will get due credit for his contributions. The trust will come. I think somewhere we have missed that out i think everybody is a good person and should know that he'll get automatically trust i think that is number one now the role of academicians in and policies you talked about yes the academicians whenever they stay make a statement should make a statement in conjunction with the possible errors that can accrue with this statement and what could be the worst case scenario and the best case scenario of that error if that is there, I'm sure the politicians will think 10 times before making a decision. The, the major problem comes is that we tend to kind of bend backwards in having our technology accepted and we ignore our own thing. So we have to be more responsible in 
telling, and in fact, I, I advocate, uh, there's another talk I gave where I talk about uh, 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 the statement of relevance statement, that you say why your work is relevant and to what extent it is of relevance. What are the error margins would mean in terms of best case scenario and worst case scenario? Like the pandemic research were funded for a purpose, which was not a social purpose, not for the well-being. So I think, we, and we need to articulate against those activities. I don't think as an academia, we have ever may have a stated position on anything of consequence. Is there a statement of climate change from Indian teachers? No. Is there a statement of uh, on uh, how the pandemic response should be from Indian teachers? No. We have to come together as a community to be able to make our case and state it. I am sure the world will listen to you. We have not done our homework as much as we should have done. And I think if you recall, I mentioned once that if the Prime Minister calls it tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, if you, the Prime sir. Okay, I'm sorry. Inspiring lecture, sir. And this uh, brings us to the end of this National Science Day celebration 2022. May I now request Dr. Monisha Pandey to deliver the formal vote of thanks now. Uh, Dr. Thank Manisha. you, Professor Kamalika. Thank you, Professor Kamalika. And good afternoon to everyone. Please put on your video. Uh, my video is on. Uh, on behalf okay. of Seminar and Cultural Committee, School of Sciences, as well as on my personal behalf, first of all, I express my heartfelt gratitude to Almighty for making today's event successful despite network glitch. Today, we had the opportunity to hear brainstorming thoughts on integrated approach in science and technology for sustainable future from our esteemed chief guest, Dr. Subhash Sarkar, Honorable Minister of State, Ministry of Education, Government of India. Thank you so much, sir, for adorning the occasion, reminding us about our traditional knowledge system and enlightening us with your wise words. We really feel privileged that despite your engaging schedule, you joined us for celebrating yes. National Science Day at IGNU. I also express my heartfelt thanks to Professor A.K. Singhvi, DSP Sub Chair Professor at PRL, for sharing his wisdom on ethics, automation, haves and have-nots, scientific social responsibility, Vagyanik Samajik Daitwa, is the ethical obligation of knowledge workers in all the fields of science and technology, to voluntarily contribute their knowledge and resources to the widest spectrum of stakeholders in society in a spirit of service in a spirit of service and conscious reciprocity you have very right, rightly and nicely mentioned uh, these things to us sir thank you for joining us now i take the opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to our honorable vice chancellor professor nageshwar rao who is our pillar of strength and guiding force. Thank you so much, sir, for your constant support and encouragement. With deep sense of appreciation, I thank all the pro vice chancellors at IGNU, directors of schools, heads of various units and divisions, our colleagues at headquarters and regional centers all across the country for joining us in celebrating National Science Day. I am also obliged to all the people who worked behind the scene to execute this event and extend my thanks to EMPC, COE, and IGNU's social media team for wider circulation and publicity. Thanks are also due to our director, Professor Sujata Verma, for being constant source of inspiration and the committee members for evaluating the videos meticulously. Thank you. This event would not have been possible without our learners' participation. I thank all the learners for contributing to the videos and also joining us. Thank you to all those who are watching us live on Facebook and YouTube. In the end, I would express my gratitude to all the members of Seminar and Cultural Committee, School of Sciences for untiring support 
and acknowledge their participation and willingness to help beyond their comfort zones. Thank you all. विज्ञान का मानव जीवन से बहुत गहरा संबंध है विज्ञान का शिक्षण सभी जब विज्ञान शिक्षण दैनिक जीवन की क्रियाओं पर आधारित हो आधुनिक मानव समाज के कल्याण को बिना विज्ञान के बिना हम नहीं मान सकते हैं मुझे पूर्ण विश्वास है कि अपने सतत प्रयासों से हम एक संधारणीय भविष्य की कल्पना को साकार कर सकेंगे विभिन्न माध्यमों से हमसे जुड़ने के लिए आप सभी का हृदय तल से आभार धन्यवाद राम बिगिनिंग till the end we are yeah. so happy and privileged so and now process uh, will be also very informative and enthralling yes and very relevant issue you have raised sir and we are very thankful to you sir and one issue if you give me one moment one issue of great concern is uh, uh, under representation of women in science sir we would like to take it up also sir so that is uh, more inclusive in science 